Louis Lumiere, the inventor of the first motion picture camera, sent a crew to Russia on a special commission to shoot a solemn event in 1896. Midday on May the 14th, at the Kremlin in Moscow, the coronation of the Russian Emperor, Nicholas II. During the Soviet period, he would have been described as a tyrant and an oppressor of the working class. Many people in Russia have different opinions on the country's last emperor. In certain quarters, he's considered to be a model statesman and even a murderer. However, it's also believed he was a faceless politician who ruined his country. He's referred to as Nicholas the Slaughterer and the Tsar Martyr. But who really was Nicholas II, the last Russian emperor? Dmitry Shmarin is a realist painter. He lives in Moscow and studies the life and times of the last Russian emperor. Nicholas II is a constant source of inspiration for the artist. During the Soviet period, when Dmitry was at art school, he read a book on Nicholas II and his family. I have no doubts Russia will one day restore the monarchy and have a Russian Tsar again. It'll happen, by all means. If it happens in another Russia, with other boundaries, it is a different story. But prophets once said, following the uprising of 1917, after the bloodshed, destruction and decay under communist rulers, Russia will have an orthodox monarchy once again. Dmitry is a descendant of the Don Cossacks. His ancestors served with the Royal Guard. Some of his close relatives were monarchists, but they had to keep their silence during the Soviet era. Dmitry is now happy to openly express his opinions. His first large-scale painting was devoted to the royal family. He then created a series of paintings entitled The Life of Nicholas II. He's now working on a new canvas. It's dedicated to the history of the Romanovs. How could such bright, pure and beautiful people have fallen victim to the blackguard, possessed with a raving hatred? It's totally illogical and senseless. A ball is being held in central Moscow. It's like a scene from the early 20th century. The waltz, the mazur and the polonaise. Courteous gentlemen ask ladies in crinolines for the pleasure of a dance. The Russian gentry is together once again. These people are preserving the family names which were once famous across Russia. During the Russian Empire, noble families formed a special union called the Gentry Assembly. Descendants of Russian princes, counts and barons are now restoring the traditions of their forefathers. While the young generation perfects their dance steps, the elder members of the Gentry Assembly discuss their country's destiny and in an adjoining room. They share the same point of view on what policy should be pursued. There's no doubt nobility cannot exist without a source of honor, without being under the aegis of the Russian imperial house. Therefore, there's always a demand for an external source of honor to create the foundation for the assembly's activity. Russian historian Sergei Simonov has been carrying out research on the rule of Nicholas II for many years. He's got an extensive collection of memorabilia from that era. It's evidence of the glory and the might of the Russian monarchy. But there's another object, which is a reminder of a great tragedy that marked the rule of the last emperor. Hadinka Field. It's close to central Moscow. Thousands gathered here to celebrate the coronation of the emperor. It was all very badly organized. People died in a stampede, vying for the right to get a special mug with Nicholas's monogram. People were given a mug, gingerbread, a drink, or something else. Nine years later, a similar incident happened in St. Petersburg. 
On January the 9th, 1905, thousands of demonstrators took to the streets in the empire's capital. Incited by provocateurs, they clashed with police. Soldiers opened fire, killing hundreds of people. It went down in history as Bloody Sunday. Nicholas II didn't give a personal command to fire at the workers heading to the Winter Palace on January the 9th. But at the same time, he didn't stop those who gave the orders to disperse the crowd to shoot at the people. Bloody Sunday sparked a wave of violence across the country. Russian socialists tried to stage a revolution. To avoid a national disaster, Nicholas II started a program of reforms. The Tsar ushered in civil rights and freedoms and sanctioned the election of the first parliament, known as the State Duma. This move helped to create political balance and economic growth. Industry developed at a fast pace, as well as agriculture and trade. Today, Russian historians often criticize Nicholas II in his role as a statesman. It's hard for me to say this, but going on general accounts, he wasn't much of a ruler, to put it mildly. He lived in a time when only a powerful personality like Peter the Great could lead the nation and control the situation, whereas Nicholas was born, as the poem goes, for a peaceful life, for the country's silence. This monument was erected in the settlement of Tyninskoye in the Moscow region in 1996, on the 100th anniversary of the last emperor's coronation. Hundreds of people from across Russia gather here every year to pay their respect to the Tsar. Russian monarchists are convinced that the nation made a serious mistake at the beginning of the 20th century by killing the Tsar. Not only the killers are to blame for the blood of the Tsar and his family. Every human being is responsible for this, the whole of the Russian nation. We're guilty because our ancestors did not help, did not rise against it, did not utter a word of protest. Nicholas II was the eldest son of the Emperor Alexander III. He was born in St. Petersburg on May 18, 1868. Children from the royal family were given a good education at home. Nicholas spoke three foreign languages, English, French, and German. Dynastic marriages are usually marriages of convenience. It so happened, this time Nicholas II's marriage was a happy one. He loved his wife. In keeping with the royal tradition, Nicholas II was obliged to marry a woman with a royal background. Nicholas chose the princess of hessen darmstadt who came from German nobility. The princess, whose first name was Elisa, converted to Orthodox Christianity and adopted the name of Alexandra. Nicholas, like his forefathers, was not indigenous to Russia. The Romanov family was closer to the German, Danish, and British royal families. Nicholas was Queen Victoria's great-nephew, and King George V was his cousin. They were like two sides of the same coin. They sported similar beards and were the same height. They swapped their clothes and no one could tell who was the Russian emperor and who was the British king. They joked a lot. But mortal danger dogged the last Russian emperor from an early age. When Nicholas was 12, revolutionaries from an underground socialist organization killed his grandfather, Emperor Alexander II. An era of political terror evolved in Russia under the rule of Nicholas II. 
Revolutionary socialists and terrorists hunted down the last emperor. Two Russian interior ministers, the chief prosecutor, the chief of police, and the governor of St. Petersburg died at the hands of terrorists. In 1905, an uncle of Nicholas II and another member of the royal family, the Moscow general governor, Grand Prince Sergei Romanov, were killed in 1905. A revolutionary assassinated the Russian Prime Minister, Pyotr Stolypin, in 1911. However, neither the Tsar nor his family were attacked during his reign.